Today we're going to talk about some different aspects of the First World War that could come up on an IB history exam, uh, starting with the, the home fronts during the war. Uh, First World War sees a far greater government intrusion into the lives of, of everyday citizens uh, throughout all of the nations fighting in the war. In Britain, for example, with the institution of what was known as war socialism, uh, the, the government took over many aspects of the British economy um, to, to better mobilize the nation for, for the total war that they were now fighting in, including taking over ro uh, railways, uh, taking over... Uh, raw materials for armament factories, uh, ordering the rationing of food, uh, and here you see a, uh, a ration card for sugar in, in Britain, um, conscription uh, of, of workers into necessary industries, strikes would be made illegal in England during the course of the war. In the United States, uh, with the passage of the Espionage Act in 1917, the federal government essentially made it illegal um, to... Uh, not only support enemy nations during the war, but also to dissent against American policies. Uh, this would later be deemed unconstitutional, but it was certainly an attempt by the federal government to exert more control during the war years. Um, in all of the belligerent nations, um, the the size and the scope of the central power, uh, central governmental power, would grow. Um, each nation conscripted massive uh, armies to, to fight the war, and in all of them, France, Britain, Germany, Austria, central governments ultimately um, used the, their governmental powers or, or enhanced their governmental powers to execute the war in the, the way they saw fit. Um, and in many cases, the leadership, the military leadership, uh, were beyond criticism in, in each of the nations involved. Uh, nations also uh, spent uh, government money and, and put a lot of effort towards a propaganda drive, um, whether it be to to drive countries like America into the war, for example, if you were if you were the British, um, or to to garner more support from your home front for fighting the war, um, or to convince your your citizens that the war was worth fighting as as it dragged on. Um, not just through months, but but years. Um, and here we see a, a couple instances where where Germans are being dehumanized by American um, by American propaganda during the war. Uh, you can also see in this uh, poster on the right the push to sell liberty bonds. Uh, the the U.S. federal government um, raised money for the war with the selling of of liberty bonds. Uh, these are essentially savings bonds that could be purchased by American citizens in order to fund the war effort and that promised a, a small percentage interest in return um, following the war. Um, it's also important to note during the war that uh, with the massive need for men on the, on the battlefield, um, there were openings in the workforce for women where there previously weren't. Uh, and here we see a photo of, of women working in a factory, and this would be seen not only in Britain and in France, but also um, stretching into the United States. This would have a tremendous impact on the suffrage movement um, following the war. Um, a couple other areas of the war to talk about uh, that we've not specifically mentioned in other in other videos uh, is the war at sea. Um, the IB loves to ask questions uh, of you about uh, sea power during during the 20th century wars or, or air power during the 20th century war. So I just want to run through a couple things um, with regard to the war at sea for the First World War. Uh, each Britain and Germany attempted an economic blockade of their enemy. Um, and this is a great example of economic warfare, another example Example, or another aspect, I should say, of total war. Uh, Germany attempted to do them with their U-boats, Britain with their mines and with their navy. Um, Britain's blockade um, was far more successful than the Germans, uh, just because they had um, a greater number of, of ships to throw at them, uh, to throw at the blockade. Both Germany and Britain had built large surface fleets in the lead up to the war, including the new dreadnought battleships. Um, at the start of the war, Britain had 20 of these advanced battleships, while Germany had 13. Um, the, the only point during the uh, course of the Second World War, though, that those battleships would ever meet in, in a battle uh, came in May of 1916 at the Battle of the Jutland off the coast of Denmark. Um, this was the, the largest naval battle of the First World War. The outcome of this Battle of the Jutland um, was um, 
a little bit indecisive. The British lost 14 ships, the Germans lost 11. Uh, both sides would claim a victory, but ultimately it was the British who would still maintain their blockade of, of the, uh, the German nation following this battle. Uh, so those supply routes for Germany would never be opened, and ultimately it's more of a British victory. Uh, but overall, the surface fleets played a relatively small war, uh, role in the course of the war. Far greater would be the use of the U-boats of, of Germany. Uh, these could, of course, skirt under the British blockade and cause problems for um, Allied merchant vessels. German U-boats were much more effective, but we have to remember that it was the U-boats that in part led to American entry in the war, as we talked about in the last video. Um, as the war dragged on, Allied shipping started uh, to employ what was known as the convoy system, where merchant ships would be escorted by a convoy of warships, um, and this would ultimately neutralize the, uh, the impact of the U-boats. Uh, in the skies, uh, we uh, see airplanes being first used in the First World War, first as, as reconnaissance, uh, basically seeing enemy troop movements and positions um, from above. Uh, Germans and the British did conduct small-scale bombing raids on opponents, but you can see here at the, at the outset of the war, um, this is uh, what a bombing raid from, from enemy aircraft would look like, with the pilot literally dropping explosives off the side of the ship or off the side of the plane, pardon me. Uh, later in the war, um, the Germans especially would employ uh, large-scale uh, dirigibles and zeppelins like this uh, to bomb even as far as, as London itself. Uh, but this did not have a major impact on, on the course of the war, but it was a sign of things to come, and certainly by the Second World War, by the years leading up to the Second World War, Britain kept this, uh, this bombing in their mind, and they, they knew what a second war would bring. Um, more, more famous from First World War air, air power is the dogfight, where fighter aces from various countries would become war heroes and become crucial in the propaganda fight. For example, uh, the German Baron von Richthofen, uh, the Red Baron, and an American pilot named Eddie Rickenbacker, uh, the, these pilots became national heroes and were used by the propaganda arms of their nations. But ultimately, air power did not really have a major factor on the outcome of the war. Other technologies uh, during the First World War need to be mentioned. Uh, we've got tanks uh, developed initially by the British to transverse the no-man's land between the, uh, the trench lines. Uh, first seeing action at the Battle of the Somme on the Western Front, but the tank did not break through the enemy trenches and ultimately had little impact on the outcome. Oftentimes the tanks would break down uh, or be, be trapped in the... Uh, in the shell craters uh, in no man's land and not actually be able to to make it all the way through. Um, another new technology of the First World War is the flamethrower developed in Germany and first used in World War I. It could neutralize enemy troops and trenches without um, ultimately uh, destroying the trenches. Um, and this was important because as the front lines would advance, um, as the Germans, for example, might push forward and, and defeat the French or the British initial lines of trenches, the Germans would simply now occupy those new trenches. This was not possible if they were simply destroyed by artillery. Um, flamethrowers ultimately did not prove to be a great difference maker. Another new technology of the First World War that's already been mentioned is the, the use of poison gas, used by both sides, but first deployed successfully by the Germans at the Battle of Ypres in 1915. Uh, but soon after the development of poison gas, as you can see in this photo here, enemy or, or soldiers uh, would use gas masks to defend against the poison gases. So this, again, was not necessarily a deal breaker in, in the course of the war. A technology that existed long before the First World War, uh, or at least certainly in the decades before the First World War, uh, but would see its greatest use in this war, is the machine gun. Um, this would uh, be a, a tremendous defensive weapon uh, for, for all sides, and ultimately it, it is what caused the stalemate and the, the tremendous destruction on the Western Front. Um, also, as the war developed, tracer bullets would be developed for these machine guns, where, where the, uh, every fifth round, for example, um, might be a tracer round where uh, the, the gunner could see actually where his bullets are, are, are being targeted rather than just f uh, firing blindly ahead. Um, 
connecting machine guns to airplanes was a, an important development during the uh, the First World War. Um, in the earliest days of the First World War, machine gunners uh, sat at the tail of an airplane, um, but this was also often dangerous as as they could run the risk of shooting their own planes. Um, Eventually, it was attempted to, to mount machine guns on the front of planes. This was a problem, though, um, with machine guns possibly, or with the bullets possibly hitting the propellers of the airplanes um, and damaging the propellers or even ricocheting back and killing the, the pilot himself. Um, this was attempted to originally be solved by just putting more metal onto the, uh, onto the uh, propellers to protect them, but that certainly did not help the pilots from, from ricochets. Eventually, uh, the French developed an interrupter gear uh, that allowed machine guns to be placed on the nose of airplanes and fired between the propeller blades as the propellers would, sp um, would spin. Um, this technology certainly um, would enhance uh, the, the air fighting that would, was taking place. But, of course, as soon as a, a French plane with an interrupter gear is shot down um, and the Germans can get their eyes on it, um, they will have that same technology. On the open seas, some technologies to note, um, the use of depth charges. A depth charge um, is essentially an, an underwater bomb that can be set to uh, explode at a certain depth uh, within the ocean. Uh, these were used to attempt to target submarines underwater. And finally, in order to find those submarines, um, the hydrophone was developed. These are essentially underwater microphones that were used to listen for submarines. Um, and here's this is a technology that predates the sonar that will eventually be used in the Second World War. Combining air power and sea power is the advent of the aircraft carrier. Uh, the aircraft carrier was born during the First World War. Um, it's going to have some limited use, um, but it will make its arrival on on the war scene uh, during this this conflict. So there you have it, a number of new technologies and, and some realities of the home fronts during the uh, First World War. And we will talk to you very soon.